Welcome back, Double Teamed fam. This is Cami again, and we've brought you another very kinky guest today. You might know him on Instagram as at the funny dom. We're gonna call him Sir today. And if you wanna say hi real quick. Oh, that's for me? Yep, yep. <laughs> you know, yeah, you... <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night if you're being naughty and you're staying up too late. Oh, there we go. Love that. And of course, Nikki is here. Say hello. And we thank him for joining us today. You guys know we love all the kinky stuff. And we wanted to bring a dom along to, you know, tell us a little bit about their side of the dom sub world. You guys know how much Kimi and I love to explore it. And we're super excited to have him here today. So, you know what? We're just going to dive right in. It's going to be a little bit of a Q&A session to get you know, uh, get to know you a little bit and also for our listeners to get to know you. So probably first and foremost, probably my favorite question to ask everyone, what inspired your entrance into the Dom sub world? Ooh, inspired. I think that goes a long way back. I think there's been hundreds of inspirations. I think a lot of people realize once they've crossed the threshold and embraced who they are, you start looking back and you think, hey, what was the thing with Ming the Merciless in that Flash Gordon movie? Or why did the Adams Family speak to me in a strange way? Or Gomez and Morticia is still one of the best relationships I've ever seen on screen. All those things, the Dracula movie was a big one. All these things kind of like they push a button, but that's the thing, the button is already there. So it's really about realizing that you have that button and then pushing it yourself. So for me, I think it's always been the case that I've been a dom, but really it took a long time to process that and acknowledge it and embrace it and also to do the self-work and realize how to reconcile the issues of masculinity, the toxic issues that masculinity has, and to overcome the things that that brings up as a male who does not want to be part of that and can't be part of that to realize that being a dom and a good dom and a good daddy is actually the opposite of anything toxic and anything cruel or hurtful while still being very sadistic. Absolutely. I I really like that you mentioned, you know, kind of from a male perspective, the masculinity aspect of it. I know that's something that we mentioned in the episode where we briefly talked about it. I think in a way, it's like healthy masculinity that allows you to, I think, become a dom where, you know, not only do you understand what role the masculine energy plays, but also, you know, how that ties into the feminine energy or, you know, if, if it's too masculine, however, but in, in a way that that's healthy for both the dom and the sub, because I think that's huge in this world. It's not only the trust, but the healthy relationship between the two, because I think a lot of people, when they look at examples of it, it can look a little our, one of our guests even said it. He was like, is that not toxic? And immediately we we're both like, no, no, not at all. Like they're, they're very endearing relationships. If I may ask, when were you able to fully, I guess, experience it? Like when were, when did you find, I guess, a sub to enter that world with? One of my first relationships that was not very long, it was only several times together, but anyone who's been in DS dynamic can probably attest even weeks or months can be very intense and feel a lot longer than you know vanilla time I call it uh, one year in a in a vanilla relationship that's a thing but you if you're together for a year in a committed DS dynamic of any kind that's a whole nother thing so yeah our first partner was a uh, actually a, a switch who's she was a professional dom who was also a little and that was a massive learning curve for me because she had to top from the bottom a little bit just in just in a, a bit of guidance and a bit of assurance but seeing her be able to have that professional experience and that kind of level and then also have a packy and want to be cared for was mind expanding for me i love that especially you know since she was you know like you said a yeah, very experienced in it. Well, I have a quick question. Oh, go ahead. Sure. Can I ask what age that was for you? Probably about five years ago. Oh, wow. 
Okay. So, yeah, it took me a long time to embrace. In hindsight, you can look back and see relationships that were dynamic, but in terms of being to the point where you meet someone as that identity and say, I am this, you are that, that took a long time. And that took a going, again, very common, I think, a long-term relationship that was not satisfying on that level and getting out of that and reassessing and realising what is missing and realising that that's, it's you, it's part of yourself, that you're not really accepting and leaning into. Before I get to the question, I was going to ask what you said that reminds me, did you have any initial shame in it? If oh, abs- absolutely. I think probably for a few decades. Oh, and wow. I think that's where that male thing comes from, the idea that you've got interests or, or urges that um, to you, you know, might seem negative or abusive. It gives you a lot of shame um, as, a, as a male, I think. Uh, it's almost a, a good sign that it should. It should give you caution um, and make you do the work and grow up a little bit, which is why it is difficult, I think, for a lot of, a lot of males that um, do have a good balance on that. They actually second-guess themselves and pull away, and then you've got a lot of males who don't have that, uh, that, that uh, awareness, and they just lean into it and go, oh, I'm just a dumb, I can do whatever I want. So you have this middle ground of people that aren't there, which is all the, all the doms doing the work and improving themselves. Are there any sources that you recommend for doing that work? Any books in particular or maybe podcasts or, or influencers of people who or sources that you leveraged when doing that inner work to either overcome that shame or prepare yourself as a dom? There's plenty. I think it's a little bit it's a little bit like uh, just maybe think of Ram Das. It's a little bit like other forms of self work. All that stuff is good, but it doesn't it doesn't really do anything or change you. That's only something that you can do and figuring out where that identity comes from in your life and what you want it to achieve. But all of the support and insights of others is like, it definitely helps. For me, the last few years, Ask a Sub, Lena Dern has been massive. Um, seeing all her, her work and seeing her do it with a light heart is what really inspired me hearing that she had a comedy interest and that's where she actually came from, that's the same as myself. So that was a huge one. I always tell anyone I meet, even if it's just casually, if they're new, I say, are you following Ask Us Up? Do it now. Read everything that she's written. It will help. Sub or Dom. Uh, Also, I thought Madison Young's memoir, Daddy, was really good. I don't know if you've heard of that. I haven't. I'm going to write that down. Madison Young. It's a really good read as well as more human than just many of the books like The Topping Book and Loving Dominant. They're all good, but they're very textbook. They're very practical, which is great, but sometimes you just want a good book. And Madison Young's book is an autobiography, her real story of her life and her finding her submission and also her issues with her own partner. And for a dom, reading that was, again, like empathy is so important for a dom. So reading that was another massive effect that helped me. And I always recommend that to other partners. Definitely. I'm going to have to look into some of these. I do follow Ask a Sub as well. I recently started following her, to be honest, just because for a while I, I wasn't necessarily diving into my dom sub interest as well. And so I, I met a couple recently that reminded me just how much I loved it. Did you mention earlier that you have two and a half masters? <laughs> so I have, <laughs> there's a couple that I see, they're both doms. He's a dom, she's a switch, and but they dom me together. And they're both pro doms. So they actually teach workshops and everything on it as well. And they have a wonderful dynamic between the two of them, since she's also his submissive. But then with me, they just do a phenomenal job. And, and once I met them, I realized I wanted to to get back into it. So I think these resources can be really beneficial for people just to, you know, connect with others as well. And, and I think it it does kind of help lessen some of that shame if you carry any of it, because you see other people embracing that side of themselves and and leading other people to do the same. And, and I think that's where you find a lot of beauty in these influencers, these books, all these things. So I love being a sub. I'll tell anybody I'm a sub. (laughs) I know. I tend to attract a lot of doms, which considering that right now I don't have a dom, 
I might start looking for one soon. I hope I do. I mean, I miss the world for sure. So for me, like, yeah, I like love vanilla sex, but I do miss having a daddy. So I'm definitely going to read some of the books that you just suggested. I'm yeah, I'm really curious very about that interested. memoir. Especially if you're in between dominance, if you read Daddy, you're going to have several nights of swooning <laughs> movement. There's a few pages in there that will will make you put the book down and just have a little a little breath. A moment right. to yourself. Yes. I love I, that. We're I both read, avid readers. Yeah. yeah, I read a lot of Reverse Harem, which ends up being just a bunch of sex books. So I do love and those. And quite a few of them have Dom Sub in it. Yeah, they do. But so actually, when we were talking about introductions to it all, Kimi and I's, I think, introduction to it was when we read Fifty Shades of Grey <laughs> in like, what, early high school days? No, it was like the first year of college. No, I thought it was earlier than that. No, for me, it was the first year of college. Oh, I remember that. that. Yeah, so that that was my introduction to it. Okay, so I have a question. Have you ever done 24-7, Dom? Uh, Yes, I'm currently in a 24-7 dynamic right Ah, now. I've been meaning to ask how many subs you have. Yeah, if you don't mind telling us or if you can kind of give us a general idea, what are your current structures that you're in? So I currently have an owned submissive that is a 24-7 dynamic. I also have another submissive partner and I have a kind of newer relationship with a, with a little that is still very new. So I would hazard to say it's you know a set dynamic, but that's something that's also happening. And I also have a friend, a submissive partner in another state, but it's very difficult to see her obviously with lockdowns and travel restrictions. So that's kind of a distance, kind of on hold kind of thing. Like a comet partner? Um, yeah, I suppose because of the state of the world for the past year and, and us just working it out, I suppose it basically, it, it does fit the area of kind of comet satellite. Yeah. I would say two and uh, and, and possibly three. <laughs> it's complicated. Nice. That's awesome. Would you consider yourself to be like polyamorous or is this kind of a, a non-monogamous type situation? Uh, yeah, I would consider poly, solo poly which is an interesting interplay with, uh, with DS kind of structures, like having a also solo poly partner who I own is very interesting for us both to kind of navigate and figure out how that works. And are they all aware of each other, I guess, if that makes sense? Yes, yes. Nice, okay. That's very vital. Yeah. No, I agree. I just don't know. Sometimes, you know, people do the you know, they know, but or, uh, kind of, you know, don't ask, don't tell. But anyways, that's awesome. Obviously, you know, in this podcast as well. We talk about uh, non-monogamous relationships. I'm in an open marriage. Kimi is not, but you know, she's interested in it. But I, I find a lot of times that many of the people in non-monogamy or polyamory are also interested in the in the dom sub world. So not for every situation, but there is quite a bit of overlap in that as well. But I'm curious about the 24-7. I've never done that. And I guess I've always shied away from it just because I tend to be a very type A person, but I do consider myself to be a switch. But I guess for 24-7, what, what are the most fulfilling parts for you about 24-7? Like, or I guess, is there anything that you can kind of tell us about it to help us understand it more? Because that's one I just have never really tried. Sure. For me, it's very natural. So I will kind of naturally start elements of that behavior in any relationship that's going very well. And I think that is connected to the daddy aspect. So being partially a caregiver means that, you know, you want to make sure that someone is doing well and and living well, even when you're not together or in a session. So unless there is a boundary put in place to make it kind of seen or session only, I will very naturally and quickly tend to casually ask, did you sleep well or, you know, have you had breakfast yet? These kind of things will come up. And if someone hasn't had breakfast or isn't sleeping well, that really does prompt me to try and to want to get involved. And part of that is I think a big part of the 24-7 is is actually trying to support somebody's self-care that's one of the most satisfying things for me. Like one of my favorite things to be sent is actually, it's a nude, but it's actually a nude because it's a bath photo. Like being sent a photo of a sub in a bath with candles, you know, reading, like actually just self-caring and relaxing is one of the most pleasing things I can be sent by a partner. I love that. It reminds me the very first dom I ever had would bathe me after our sessions. 
So that brought me way back. What? Yeah, that brought me way back. What do you mean, what? Oh, I guess we, <laughs> I guess we never really talked about my earlier dogs. You didn't tell me that? Okay, we can talk about it uh, offline. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Anyways, I love that. I love that, too. I want someone to bathe with me. I know, yeah, bathing it, and washing is a big aftercare. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a big one for sure. I always get the, you know, the gentle towel <laughs> cleaning up the cup. <laughs> yeah, well, there there should be a there should be a bath I think following that too. Well, when you have a shower, <laughs> when you're with them, if you guys go out in public and stuff, do you have certain protocols or levels of protocols that you practice with them? Do they have collars? Yes, it depends on each each relationship, but generally there is a level of dynamic with me at all times. Again, unless there is a boundary put in place for there not to be, but that would be difficult for me. So there is a general dynamic. I would usually say underneath everything. So everything can be done. So you can do something very, you know, ordinary and normal life-based, but underneath it, there's always the dynamic. So yeah, getting lunch or a coffee at a cafe is very normal, but maybe I'll have you put sugar into my coffee for me and stir it a specific number of times while I wait. You know, they're very small things that aren't going to be noticeable to anyone else, but make the most kind of ordinary things very kinky. I love that. With the two doms that I uh, see, she's always on his right side. That's part of their protocol. So I naturally fall on his left. And so there are certain parts of their protocol that they kind of clue me in on. And, you know, sometimes they'll discuss, you know, things that they want me to do. So I love that. I I agree. You know, people aren't going to notice that maybe she's always on his right or people aren't going to notice that maybe your sub serves you first before and uh, before themselves, things like that. But we know that's what matters. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. it adds a level of endearment, of trust, of kink to it. And, and I think that's one of my favorite parts of it as well. And a lot of the rules are very wholesome. A lot of the protocols are actually very, they're not something out of a Fifty Shades movie or something, you know, scandalous or sensational that always ends up rubbing more people the wrong way than the right way. They're usually very nice things. So one of our general ones with my own partner is when I see her on a about a weekly basis, her first need, her first must is to get on her knees um, at my feet and then just tell me about her week and her behavior and if she's followed her rules, if anything has been difficult, you know, what she's done, that she's done well, and then she can kind of accept some some care and some praise and also what will be punishable at some point that day. And she's very satisfied with that. She really likes that protocol. And we wouldn't do that in public that would be almost a level of kind of punishment to make her do it in public because she would have to. But in private, as soon as we are alone, that's what she has to do on a weekly basis. I love that. Yeah, I do too. Anytime anyone has protocol for me that also requires me on my knees, it's one of my favorite things. So that's amazing. For my old Dom and I, it would always be as soon as I walked in the door, I'd get on my knees. But I mean, I would say we would just like go straight into it. We wouldn't necessarily, sometimes we would, you know, chat up about our day a little bit, but normally we, and I, this was like more of an unspoken protocol, but just generally how it always happened. We just, as soon as we saw each other in private places, that's how it went. So I like the aspect of telling someone about your day and, you know, going through what deserves praise and what deserves punishment. We love punishment. So. Yeah. May I ask, <laughs> what is your favorite form of punishment to give? Um, I always disclaim that it really does depend on the partner because a partner's limits and preferences really is the number one thing for any Dom. But impact is my natural favorite. And it always is make, makes me much, much uh, more comfortable and happy when I find out that a potential partner is into impact and spanking because that is definitely my favorite it's my favorite too we have a lot in common i'm starting to gather (laughs) now okay for impact play do you have any particular toys that you like to use my doms have a phone book it's like this piece of leather they call it a phone book that's what we call it we have like nicknames for all the toys that we use and it's like it's a suede thick piece of leather that we use wow and it's my absolute favorite for impact play and then there's also bonk, which is like this like leather hammer. 
which is my least favorite. So, and they know that because I tell them, I'm like, I do not like bonk. And so they only pull out bonk if there's enough of a punishment and, you know, they'll let me know that they think it's worthy of bonk. And then like, I decide at that point, like if I'm like ready for it. Anyways, so do you have any particular impact play toys that are your favorite? First of all, the cute names, adorable. (laughs) And that is a really good, again, also a thing to highlight that there can be forms of punishment or of anything that actual punishment and that kind of punishment kind of delineation, I think is very important. So there are things like there can be a cane that a partner knows that that's only really going to be used if it needs to be. And so, yeah, that's very important. For me, it's just my hands, I think, just uh, over the knee. Hands is probably number one. I do really like my flogger. I have a glass-handled flogger. It is really good. Uh, I really enjoy that. <laughs> and it has a few versatile uses because the handle is basically a dildo. Um, so wow. I do like that. I do like the canes because of the psychological threat of whipping them just through the air Mm -hmm. over the partner and just the amount of anticipation that they have and the welts and the marks that they leave I like marking but they are intense so they would only get used when the rule or the behavior has been you know has crossed a line or broken a rule so typically yeah I think just my hands I like that I prefer to be spanked with just Good old hand. Yeah. I mean, they do a great job. But like mine, like punishment, punishment was always like pinching nipples. I I hate that. So yeah, he knew if there was really something worth punishing, like actual punishment, then yeah, it would be few nipples. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, they would use bonk on me or they have these nipple clamps that are pretty intense too. So I can, I can relate to the, you would hate them. See, no, nipple clamps are hard pass. Hard pass. Hard (laughs) pass. No, absolutely not. I I've, I've had... Partners that are one way or the other, for some, it's literally just like putting on a blindfold. It's just like a fun sensation. And then others that even just the most minor light set, I've got about three different, three or four different sets of clamps, like soft limit level pain. So yeah, people really are so across the spectrum on different kinds of pain threshold. Wax for some people is nothing. And for other people, it's like quite intense. I don't think I've ever tried wax. I haven't tried wax either, but it's on my list. Honestly, I feel like I've I've learned a lot, at least with this Dom couple that I've been with, because they keep pushing my boundaries in a good way. And, and I obviously give them the permission to do so, but they'll pull out stuff that I never thought I would ever be into. For example, knife play. And obviously mm, this requires a lot a big of one. trust. Yeah, a lot of trust and a lot of understanding of the situation. And I felt very safe with them. But I, I remember I was reading a book once where the Dom liked knife play. And I remember I was reading it and I was low key turned on and I was like, oh, I don't think this is a kink. And then they pulled out these scratchy pokey fingers, we called them. And it was very similar. <laughs> those are the names of the claws? Those, those are the names of the scratchy pokey fingers. Yep. <laughs> and they pulled it out and then I was like, maybe I am into knife play. So we talked about that and we tried it. And I just remember I was like, okay, yep, I'm into this. And the same with the electro play. So yeah, like, that's what I love about it. Like some of these punishments or these toys or things, especially, you know, from doms that are experienced and that have these things you kind of learn about yourself and, you know, learn different things. Have you ever had any kind of experience where maybe you learned something about yourself that you liked or one of your subs learned something that kind of came as a surprise when you both tried it (laughs) oh my goodness an answer came to mind that will make my partner blush and squeal and i'm trying to if you don't mind yeah yeah i'm intrigued yeah i think one so one time during play she basically said she was in subspace it was actually during our first session i think that was like a five hour scene and she was in subspace to the point where she said something that she was unaware that she said. I and mean, it was just a straight from so literal subconscious like kink of hers that she hadn't really embraced yet and she has since. And I hadn't either had experience with that. So that was kind of like a literal like hmm type moment. So, yeah, she but basically she just said, breed me, daddy. And she said, what? <laughs> Wait, what did she say? She said, breed me, daddy. Wait, what is this one? You don't know what a breeding kink is? Mm-mm. I might have you explain it because I don't know if I'm going to explain it correctly. Yeah, sure. It's, um, it's basically, it's a bit of an area of things, but it is basically a kink of being used and filled and bred by the dominant. And it is more to do with that feeling and that ownership and put to use and like stock and property 
then it is necessarily pregnancy related, but there is an overlap to that where there is the kind of reach of the kink of being seated, impregnated, which again is leans into the kind of being used, put to use. Oh, okay. Okay. I love that. So I have that kink apparently. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I, this word describes what I like. Well, that's, that's how... Yeah, I love your explanation. There was much more eloquently put than I was going to say. I was going to say, like, just to be so the impregnated, but the way you put it was much better. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a bit of a range there because some people... In subspace, I would say, yeah. Some people just like the the being filled is really where they go, and that's very common, and then I think that's almost like the beginning threshold of breeding kink, and then people stop because obviously practically most of the time we don't want that. And there's actually a lot of anxiety around fluid bonding and all of that. So I think a lot of people don't get to explore it and they're a little bit more taboo about it in an odd way. And she was as well. And she was probably worried that I might have a bad reaction to it. But as is the case with most of those things, like hearing it and knowing that it was coming from her subspace was the hottest thing that I could have heard. So, And then bringing it up later during aftercare just to torture her, again, so satisfying. <laughs> It's still something I can kind of bring up out of the blue and she just gets, you know, spacey and fuzzy about it. I love that. I'm a little turned on. on I know. I'm like, <laughs> oh, dang it. Oh, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily have a breeding kink, but I did have two guys that had breeding kinks. And I wasn't into it with at least the first one because the way he went about it kind of creeped me out. I'm oh, like, is this the one that wanted to get you pregnant? Yeah, right? yeah. He not only did he have a breeding kink, but he like wanted it to like come to fruit. And I'm like, <laughs> this is like borderline. I'm like, I don't know. Anyways, that's beautiful. I love that. For me, it was knife play. So for her, it was a breeding kink. If I could ask every dom sub person that question, I would because there's nothing quite like the moment of realizing you have this kink. And it comes to life and you're like, shit, I just learned something about myself and like, I really like this. And like, I guess, especially like depending on where you are in your, you know, dom sub journey, like I had no shame in it. And I think that's what I love the most is that I was able to like fully embrace it. And now like they're well aware of my, of my kink. And so one thing that I learned in my subspace was I absolutely hate this in vanilla play, but when a dom spits in my mouth... (laughs) I love that. During subspace? Yes, yeah. during subspace. But if it's just regular sex, it will turn me off so quick. I will not mm. want to continue, like, at all. I can see that. I mean, because, like, if, it, if I was having vanilla sex with a dude and they pulled out a knife. Yeah, yeah, pulled out a knife. You know, you know, we're leaving. Bye. bye. He's like, we're, we're done here. A lot of what happens in a dynamic is utterly different without the context of the dynamic. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. Like you don't have to go as extreme as a knife, but certainly that's a runaway red flag. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, we'll move along to the next question. The world doesn't need to know everything about my knife kink. <laughs> so one thing I did want to ask if what is kind of your ideal or your favorite scenario? Is there one that like if you could just relive it again or if you know you had to like list like the top moment, like what's your ideal scenario in Dom Sub? Oh, wow. I'm almost grateful that that's not an easy thing to answer and might not even be possible. I, I have, yeah, I mean, there's different different dynamics have such different things. I do like the inter kind of hierarchy dynamic of group, of having, you know, three or so kind of participants and having a kind of structure to the dynamic. I find that's very rich, but there's literally so, so many experiences that are all they're all like 11s out of 10s for me and so yeah picking one is like it's just like foods or anything when you when you when you have something that you're passionate about and that you love like what's your favorite one oh no there's so many and i would like to eat one forever but why would i just picking one is like no (laughs) i'm not enough of a masochist to have to choose (laughs) (laughs) that's fair i like that Is there anything that you haven't tried yet, but you're curious about? And you asked this the other day on your Instagram Q&A, what people were curious about. And I loved reading through all the responses. I noticed there was a lot of CNC, which I then took a moment to decide for myself if I'm curious about CNC and because I've never tried it. But is there anything specific that you maybe have not tried yet, but would like to? Possibly more CNC. 
I've only experimented a little bit with that. I'm always been, and, and you would have seen on that, that run of stories, like it's very common and I think it's also commonly handled badly. So I'm always cautious about it and I don't think people should be trifling with it until they have a dynamic that's been going for a while and there's very good trust and communication. So it's often not possible and shouldn't be. But my current relationship is very stable, I would say, both are. So yeah, possibly that a bit more. The kind of primal hunter prey area of it is something that I think several of my partners are are very into. And I definitely have been finding myself comfortable enough to let more of my primal identity out, which again is a kind of ever-increasing kind of comfort. The more you feel safe as a dom, the more you can unleash more of that. So that's still a kind of expanding part of my um, experience. So probably that area, I think. Absolutely. No, I agree with that in that it's when you have a safe space that you feel, you know, kind of willing to to explore more and, and let loose and and let go of any of the insecurities or fears or shame or anything that you have around like things that you want to try. I'll never forget one guy told me this one phrase that has always stuck to me. He was like, it's easier to let your freak flag fly when you're supported. And I'm like, I really like that. But it's it's kind of how it is for me too with those two doms. You know, I don't think I would have ever ventured into half the things that we've done if it wasn't for the safe space that they created for me. So, and I think that's amazing that, you know, with your subs as well, you guys have, have worked on that and, and built that. And it takes time, you know, I don't jump into, you know, BDSM with everyone and, and I definitely want to build trust and, and everything before just because there is so much trust and communication that's needed in these relationships. If you don't mind me asking, do you typically, I guess, kind of, how do you build that trust and that communication? It, like, do you date or do you kind of like form a friendship or an acquaintance or has it kind of just come naturally with the subs that you have? Because that can happen. Do you meet them generally like organically or like online? Both have happened, but usually when it's, uh, well, especially like, you know, recently, online is is a large part of it. Re- meeting someone up front in that identity makes things a little easier. And even on, uh, on like a, a vanilla kind of dating app, I always immediately tell people what I am and if they're open to that or already have an identity that uh, relates to that, then that's very welcomed. And if they're not at all, then that's not something that obviously I could be compatible with. So it kind of works out that way. But uh, usually just communication, just a lot of discussion, a lot of talk and then meeting and talking a lot and hours and hours um, ideally And that usually is enough to then move forward into some kind of early play. And again, each step of that is building trust for both people, feeling the response and feeling the care afterwards, Um, even if the play is very light or even if the play is care-based, having aftercare still is such a thing that needs to be promoted and advocated. There's still, I just heard uh, in the last week, um, someone who I had chatted to and now follows me on Instagram was messaging me about their dynamic that she was in and how she was getting 30 seconds to a minute of touch of aftercare after a session. And she was asking me if that was okay. And no, no, (laughs) it was my end. That is abysmal. Yeah, anyone anyone out there in dynamic who's thinking, oh, no, we get like, you know, minutes and that's okay, I guess. No, no, it it really, really isn't and it's very unhealthy and any partner who is supposedly a, a dominant who is not caring for you is risking not just drop but your mental well-being and aftercare should be I was actually my partner was jumping up with a formula for it, and she was saying it should be like double the actual session time. And I mean, it's hard with the formula, but that is kind of a thing to think about. If you're together for an hour, I, I think that the aftercare should be another hour. Like it should be the amount of time that you're putting into the actual experience. It's not something you bolt on. You don't have this very moving, intense experience, and then hug for five minutes and then have a shower and leave. Like that's some vanilla toxic bullshit. We're not with that. Care is as vital as saying hello initially 
which is also another thing that people don't do enough and as vital as, you know, having toys or using your honorifics correctly, like all of this is vital and aftercare, it's so important. Even if the session doesn't go well, if you nail aftercare, you're both going to be in a good place together. It's so important. I would stress fresh fruit and uh, my favourite is a, is a mango sorbet. That's my favourite thing to have. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. Now, what I, I don't know if we've asked this already. What is your favourite form of aftercare besides the mango sorbet? Or do you like, <laughs> you know, I said I love bathing. You know, I like cuddles. Yeah, cuddles. I need cuddles. What, what's your particular favourite? It's definitely cuddles and touch. Um, definitely the, the daddy and the kind of bear aspect really come out in aftercare. So hugging and, and crushing so actually getting on top being a daddy blanket or putting the sub on top and having a baby blanket squeezing and getting a bit primal i tend my primal side tends to come out in aftercare as well so i get very very grabby and squeezy and all of that being anchored it's very anchoring and grounding that's what aftercare is supposed to do so intense holding it's not just catching your breath before you get dressed it's actually making that part of the experience, its own standalone journey with the partner. So holding one another, putting on some music, always have music on because mood is so important for your well-being. So having music on, having some candles or incense and just getting to the next stage, which will be your feet on the ground or it might be another stage of play, which often happens with me because, as my partner says, my self-control is not great. <laughs> So I tend to get tend to get quite ex- re excited again during aftercare because of again because of the caregiving and the connection, which is a huge turn on. I like that. Is there always sex in your kink? No, most of the time it is. It is the overlap for me is massive, so it, it is hardwired to that. But it certainly doesn't have to be for anyone, and and people should I think do that as a practice. I think it's very healthy to see the difference. So you can do rope, shibari for one thing, is such a good kind of sensual connection play that is not inherently sexual. It can be very easily, but it's more more sensation-based than anything. So that's a good one. Also just caregiving. I have recently had a small session with, with a little just caring and that was a beautiful thing and I think helped her through a bit of a tough time she was going through and and helped me and and us in our connection I think definitely made me like had me in the kind of dd spacey vibe afterwards I love that all honestly this entire like conversation is just making me want to run to my two dogs I I love shibari I'm gonna send you a picture of my most recent shibari session it was beautiful oh Um, please that was uh, what we did with my two doms, it was just we grabbed a pizza and some white claws and just did some shibari and talked and stuff and caught up. And it was such an amazing thing. I love shibari. Honestly, it's I've never tried it. Well. You should try it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I can tell right now that you're a, <laughs> you're a bunny <laughs> just waiting to jump. <laughs> Me? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I. We need to find you a good dom. I'm so scared. Of and now you can't have mine one. because I, my two are, are very near and dear to my heart. But we'll find you. <laughs> I'm a dom. I'm a little scared of finding another dom because I really miss my other daddy that I had. So it's okay. How long has it been? A week. A week. Well, you need some more time to grieve and move on from that relationship. I People. Agree. With a dynamic like that, especially when it is, whether it's DDLG or if it's just a straight daddy dom kind of baby girl thing, that's very intense. So, yeah, give yourself some time to grieve that and appreciate it and see what worked and what didn't before you start looking for the next thing that will be even better. Yeah. I say use it, yeah, refine what you like, refine the things that you're going to be looking for in your next daddy. Like that's how that's how I would look at it. I feel like, you know, from the experiences I've had in the past, each time I was able to kind of refine a little bit more of what I wanted. So then when, when they ask me, like when we're communicating and talking about the things that I want and like, and then that's when I have that opportunity to be like, this is what I learned. This is what I like. This is what yeah. I want to do. So yeah, absolutely. Test their awareness and their uh, personality. When you have a prospect, send him a bunch of my memes. And if he doesn't react well, huge mm-hmm. red flag. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I look forward to my next dom. And there's definitely some things that I didn't get to explore with my last dom that I would really like to explore with someone else. I guess just, you know, me being vulnerable with someone in that space, you know, it does. With my other dom, it was actually very easy for us to get into it right off the bat. It was just this chemistry that we had. Now, thinking about going into meeting other doms, I just, I don't know. I guess it's just the feeling of being vulnerable. I just get a little timid, but you know, cause I want whoever, my sub has to be very much accepted, very much praised or, you know, she freaks out. So yeah. Yeah. I think you'll find it though. You'll be fine. Thank you. Um, I'll be okay. So one other question I had, and, and maybe we can use this as kind of the, the last one, but you know, we talked a little bit about kind of what inspired you in BDSM and, and also kind of all the sources out there. You know, I definitely think with anything, representation in the media is always interesting. Like, for example, in polyamory or non-monogamy. But when it comes to BDSM, are, are there things that you see, like when it is presented in the media that you think are, are wrong? Or are there things that you wish were highlighted in forms of media when talking about BDSM? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this is still such a huge thing because I did, um, I recently did had a meme on my page from the, using the image from the secretary, the uh, Spader, Maggie Gyllenhaal movie from what, 20 years ago now. And I had such a huge response and so many people messaged me and said like, this was massive for me in my childhood or in my teenage years. You know, childhood, this is quite a, quite a spicy, odd film to be watching in your adolescence. But <laughs> That's often what happens is you watch movies like that and they go, "Uh oh, now I'm awake. And we've still been waiting for 20 years for something as beautiful as that movie. There really hasn't been anything on that level. And Fifty Shades got a huge mainstream awareness and I think it drove adult toy sales up through the roof for 10 years, which is great if you owned a shop. But it also made a lot of people think like really dumb things about kink and about DS. And even Secretary is not perfect. I mean, there's no consent in the first half of that movie. It really is about two people that don't know what they are finding each other. And then at the end, they clearly have a high protocol, 24-7, communicated, beautiful relationship. We skip the bit where they read all the books and have conversations about what they were doing wrong because that's not a good film. But that's kind of what we're missing. We're missing uh, something that shows the real work and the real awareness and that that doesn't have to be boring or it doesn't have to be taking romance or anything hot out of it. Conversations are often some of the hottest things that can happen. And that's, I think, something that we're missing is seeing a relationship represented where the people are actively having not just consent conversations but actually wants and needs like saying here's what I am and what I like and then they're saying here's what I am and that actually that's like very very sexy and it doesn't have to be a guy who's a billionaire taking a virgin to his dungeon room which is weird and creepy and not a thing if that is a thing that's happening and now I'm thinking of it as frighteningly is it's a crime it's a crime that we shame and we don't want and yet we make a movie about it that's fucked up it should be two adults actually meeting and finding that they are compatible and then that their kinks align and then they do all those kinks together and explore a new level to get that you know give me that movie and I like using images from rom-coms in my kinky memes for that same reason like I like seeing Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts talk about what impact toys they should use because that's the movie that I want that's the movie that I'd like to make one day is like having a rom-com where it's when Harry met Sally but it's you know it's when Subby met Dommy you know that's that's what we need I think we need that too I agree I hate that like especially in like the media representation it always is, is taken to a very extreme almost that is very unhealthy i would say yeah even bonding which is one of the better things that has been made is it's vanilla gaze another thing that i'm trying to coin it's from a vanilla's point of view and it's clearly that even when it's doing something right it's not from our point of view so it's so hard to find something i think the polyamory has been getting a little bit better um trigonometry was a really good series um there's been more 
versions of non-conventional relationships. But in terms of kink, it's still like, ooh, ooh look, oh, she's got boots and a whip. It's like, come on. It's not based in reality. I mean, she might have boots and a whip, but let's talk about her day first. Yeah, so we're getting there. Things are getting better, but it's still hard to find really good examples. I agree. And well, we love writing. So if you'd love to like write a script with us, <laughs> I let's make a yeah, movie. Sure. I liked bonding, but I agree that there were things in it. It didn't always show as much of the conversation as I wished it would have. I like that it showed a variety of kinks That's and it. I liked that it did it in an endearing way, I thought. But I agree. It didn't necessarily dive into the work behind these relationships or even though she was you know mistress may and and they paid her to do these things there wasn't always kind of like what you said that conversational piece some but not not necessarily i would say with the the couple she went to their house oh yeah the the husband i remember that yeah i remember that yeah i mean it 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 did do some things right but it wasn't necessarily fully encompassing but i i agree i'd love to see your example there the when subby met dami i would i would love that if we can like shout out to any producers, I know that's what I was actually just put together. That. I yeah. was like, as put he, together a movie. Yep. As he said that, I was like, I'm gonna write a movie and script. credit the funny dom yes. and double team podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that kind of wraps up the majority of the questions that we had, and yeah, honestly, great conversation. I love your perspective of it all, and it sounds like. You take a lot of time to build really healthy relationships with your subs. From my two doms that I have recently been spending time with, I see the level of care that they put into it and the because they genuinely care about this space. And I feel that from you too. So in this conversation, and I really appreciate that. And I hope to our listeners that they gain something from it as well if they're interested in the dom-sub dynamic. Where do you hope to... Like, how do you hope to continue? Yeah, what are your goals? The funny dom, your yourself as a dom, do you have any goals? I really started the page just as a, a reaction to Ask a Subs during lockdown. I just thought, ah, oh, that looks like fun. Like, her memes are so funny and often make you stop and think for a second. And that's my favorite kind of anything. So I just made it to have the occasional thought. And when I started doing it, it was one funny thing every month or two it was I never thought it was going to be an actual thing and then I don't know something hit and I just started doing three or four a day and it went from 100 or 200 followers to now nearly ten and a half thousand and yeah I do them daily I've the Q&A's every week get like hundreds of questions people message and say it's helped our relationship which is incredible like again the service kind of top part of me is so happy with that I had a little message me who you know these are people I don't know from the other side of the world she messaged me because she wanted to buy me some lollies she wanted to buy me gummies that's one of the cutest things ever like just hello hello sir can I buy you some gummies like I just want it to continue just continue and more and hopefully be able to build more of a community yeah to connect with and to you know help give advice to and talk to and so, yeah, if that sounds good, as well as very, at times, spicy memes, then, yeah, come and have a look at the funny Dom on my Instagram and, and follow and, and say hi. Yes. I love your Ask a Daddy little Q&A. Q&A. Yeah, those are my favorite too. And so I, I definitely read all the responses that you do. I know I've slid in a few times. With a question. Oh, yes. What was your rather naughty contribution a few weeks ago? Was it, can I, are you asking for permission for something? <laughs> oh, what was it? Hold on. I'm that was Nikki. I remember that one. Hold on. Yeah. That made me laugh. Where was it? Oh, wait. No, was it on, it was on the double team Instagram. I don't remember what it was. I know I called you daddy and there was some punishment for that. It was very naughty, I think. Yeah, so... Hold on, let me find it. Where was it? So now he gets to call you sir. Yes, sir is is my accepted honorific calling. Actually, addressing me as daddy has to be earned. Um, I would love to earn that. I'm, I'm going to earn gonna that throw too. that out yep. there. That's, a, that's my <laughs> personal goal. <laughs> well, it, it would be more difficult for you after that overstep, so you would have extra <laughs> punishment to have to earn. I've got some groundwork to do. Yep. I'd say I'm at a good spot right now. Are so, you? Great. 
Congratulations, man. <laughs> well, thank you again. We've definitely enjoyed this conversation and we look forward to seeing more of your memes and your content. And yeah, just can't thank you enough for this. We really enjoyed this. And remember, guys, on IG at the funny dom he has some awesome memes so go check him out he's great any final words thank you to you two you're both cute and adorable and uh, <laughs> this was lovely and yeah thank you so much for following and for doing this doing more more sex positive content that talks about kink and other relationship styles i think it's great this has been a pleasure lovely to meet you both be good Thank you. We absolutely will be. Yes, sir. (laughs) With a capital S. Capital S.